Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Finance Minister Tito Mboweni delivered his 2020 budget address on Wednesday. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss some of the highlights. Hi Terence. Hi What was the overarching theme of this year's budget address? Well, I think that obviously South Africa is in a very difficult space from a growth perspective and also fiscally. Our fiscal balance is way out of kilter from where it has been in the past and where we had promised it would go. But the main theme, I think, is that to get out of this predicament from a fiscal crisis perspective is that we're going to be focusing on expenditure cuts relative to the 2019 budget baseline rather than raising taxes. So. What was announced is that about 260 billion rand over the next three years in expenditure cuts would be made relative to that 29 base, base, 2019 baseline. And that this would come uh, after offsets of about 111 billion uh, in the form of different uh, new priorities, as well, including you know, additional money for SAA and ESCOM of about 60 billion rand. The, the sum net total is 156 billion of expenditure reduction over the next three years. So this is quite a, a, a big figure. And for this year, it's about 66 billion that needs to be cut off the budget. And now if you pierce into that veil, uh, what's even more interesting is that the bulk of this 156 or 260 billion, 160 billion of it is going to have to come from the wage bill, the public sector wage bill reductions over the next uh, three years. So, and this has always been a bit of a, a holy cow within government or a very difficult nettle to grasp. And at, at, at this stage, the finance minister, Tito Mbouwini, has decided to grasp this nettle and to try and put a cap on the increases that we've been seeing for a couple of decades now on both public sectors, the, the salary bill growing because there are more civil servants. That's already stopped. There has been a freeze on hiring and there's actually fewer civil servants in the system now than there was a few years ago. But uh, the key thing is on uh, wage inflation, putting a cap on that, and even clawing back some of the already agreed commitments that have been made. Now this is a very politically thorny issue, and that's why I think no one's really grasped it before. Uh, it involves negotiations with the trade unions, very powerful not only very powerful in the public sector, but generally in the public sector, trade unions are Kasatu aligned. Kasatu, obviously, as we know, is one of the members of the Tripartite Alliance. So basically, the minister is asking a lot of the burden for this uh, fiscal rebalancing consolidation to be falling on, uh, on public servants. So it's thorny, the initial, um, uh, the initial engagement formally happened this week as well with the unions uh, around the last year of what was a, a three-year multi-year agreement to try and moderate those increases. Those are, this is an agreement that's already been made in 2018 and to try and uh, moderate the last year of the, of the hikes that went down apparently like a lead balloon as you would imagine and there's a lot of resistance being shown from the unions within the bargaining council. Uh, but this, uh, you know, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see whether this line in the sand now is going to be held by government or whether it's going to be crossed in some way this year, maybe because the agreement's already in place. And then we're going to have to try claw it back in the second two years, which is going to be very, very, very tricky. So also the other thing is that the, the, the other big headline is that we've had a bit of a blowout in terms of our debt levels and our deficit levels. Uh, a negative blowout in this case, so we're going to see a much higher deficit peaking at close to 6% of GDP, well above uh, previous forecasts. And our debt um, uh, stock levels is, is a major change in where we are going to allow our debt to rise to. to um, in the RT years, it's going to be approaching 70% of GDP. Now, in budget 2019, if I remember correctly, uh, I think we were saying that we were going to sustain our debt levels below 60% of GDP. So this is a whole 10 percentage points increase in the outer years of this uh, three-year framework. Uh, that's a major shift. Uh, it's the way we're having to finance this gap between uh, falling revenues, another fall in revenues expected of over 60 billion in revenue collection this year, and the slowing economy. Uh, and continue rises in expenditure, despite what I was saying about 
uh, this, this attempt to claw back or cut back. So there's this gap, it's going to have to be financed and it's going to be financed through debt. So we're going to see our debt to GDP levels uh, really rise uh, over the next three years and it's not going to have stabilized. So while we might see a stabilization in the deficit, that's what's outlined in the budget, coming down from the peak of 5.8% of GDP, we're not going to see a stabilization over this period in our rising debt. Was there anything in the budget to indicate that government has a plan for reigniting growth? There's a lot of emphasis in the structural reforms. And again, uh, true to script, <laughs> the minister stuck to his policy paper on economic policy reforms. It was very controversial, controversial and highly debated last year. But I think is uh, has uh, elements in there that I think uh, a lot of people feel are necessary or, 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 or really what are needed in order to reignite growth in this economy. We, our Treasury's revised our growth forecast down massively, stating that we only grew at about 0.3% last year, showing that we're going to grow at sub 1% for quite some time and just start breaching it in the outer years. It's, it's really dismal on the growth front and basically showing that the budget is not going to be a growth stimulus. So the growth stimulus for this economy has to come from outside of the public sector. It has to come through public-private partnerships or private sector investment. And uh, so the reforms unpacked and the plan unpacked in budget uh, uh, is it's fully aligned with what we heard in the State of the Nation address by the President and quite well aligned with the, the policy document of the Treasury. But it's things like getting the private sector energy generation happening, which is earmarked as the most important uh, uh, structural form that is needed to get this economy going because again electricity shortage was uh, has been identified as as a risk to growth and it has been um, a cap on growth over the last few years decades now and it continues to be so we need to get private sector generation going in and uh, uh, there there was strong alignment between the what the president said in his state of the nation what the uh, uh, energy minister, or mineral and resources and energy minister said in his response to the State of the Nation and what the Minister of Finance said, which was good to see, about getting unlocking the integrated resource plan, unlocking self-generation and really getting that going. And obviously on the other, the sort of freight logistics fronts, trying to get rail and port tariffs in line with uh, sort of global competitive norms and also telecommunications, getting this whole market more energized, liberalized, uh, getting uh, especially this uh, pent up uh, broadband supply going through the, the tender processes that we've been hearing about for some months now. And I think on our close to, we're getting to the point where we're going to see proper competitive bidding for that spectrum. So those are the really, it's nothing massively new, but that is the plan. Uh, it's very much about getting the private sector involved, getting uh, mobilizing private finance and expertise and not only in those uh, sort of uh, those sort of areas that I mentioned but also in other public infrastructure so the infrastructure fund getting that mobilized through blended finance uh, solutions using the, de the development finance institutions and the, the expertise that reside within the develop uh, development bank of southern africa to try and get that infrastructure spending on the other non-energy, non-transport side or freight logistics side, the water, the sanitation, the schooling, the hospital, start getting that spent, that infrastructure going again. Do you think enough has been done to avoid a ratings downgrade by Moody's? Well, I think that's going to be the next focus. So we had, uh, we had to see what was in the budget. It was interesting that the minister stuck to his fiscal stance that he sort of started outlining in the a medium term budget policy statement of October. He didn't really deviate massively from that. I think you know, that surprise has surprised a lot of people because there was a feeling there was just no way he was going to be able to make this 150 billion rand plus uh, cuts over the next three years and that there would have to be a VAT hike or a personal income tax hike or some other tax hike which he's, he's avoided. So the next, the next sort of point now is whether we've done enough to avoid a downgrade. I think that these issues around the deficit, although we, we, we should see a, a, a peaking within the framework, three-year framework in the deficit, uh, but particularly that rising in the debt levels is going to weigh heavily on the Moody's uh, uh, statement over the next few weeks. I think it's going to be very difficult for Moody's 
to avoid junking us. But you know, I suppose it's all, all about uh, whether the minister wasn't only persuasive in his words, but whether it's credible to expect that we're going to be able to make these cuts given the political, the hostile poli political environment, the fact that a lot of the burden is going to have to be sort of borne by uh, a key alliance partner of the African National Congress in the form of Labour, is that really going to wash? Uh, is there no other way to share the burden more pre generally across society? So the political risk uh, associated with these cuts are high. And I think when Moody's does the assessment, they'll be looking at the deficit, the debt, and the credibility issues uh, and whether politically this can, can, can really fly. The minister has said that he has the full support of his cabinet colleagues, described it as one of his nicest cabinet meetings in the history of cabinet meetings uh, when people asked whether he had the, his backing of colleagues. But that is going to be, in, uh, it's going to be interesting to see and important to, to watch, observe whether these cuts that have been announced can actually be implemented. Uh, and I think uh, Moody's is going to have to make a call as to whether they think it's credible that most of what we are offering is really a, a very, a very painful for a, sec a key constituency of the governing alliance, and whether it's really going to be able to sell that, sell it to that that constituency, and implement it. So my own view is I don't think we're going to avoid a uh, junking, um, and. Uh, but I think that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing uh, a lot of what is outlined in the 2020 budget. I think we have to, as the minister said, clean up, clean up our house, get our house in order. And we have allowed too many things to slip. One of them, uh, you know, being uh, the, the wage bill has slipped in a way. I think that's not been very uh, useful or not very been good for a certain section of the society, but we haven't seen a commensurate rise in service delivery and productivity out of the public sector. We need to start seeing that uh, first before we start raising the wage bill again. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.